Hi guys, in this video we'll go through question 12 from the 2017 HSE Mathematics Extension 2 exam. So part A, consider the function f of x equals e to the x minus 1 over e to the x plus 1. The first part says to show that f of x is increasing for all x. Okay, so whenever we want to show a function is increasing for all x or in some particular interval, we need to show that the derivative, the first derivative, is greater than 0 in that interval. So let's go ahead and differentiate this function. f dash x is equal to, now this is a quotient, so it's going to be the denominator multiplied by the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator minus the multiplied by the derivative of the denominator divided by the denominator squared. So let's tidy this up a little bit. This will give us e to the 2x plus e to the x minus e to the 2x plus e to the x divided by e to the x plus 1 or squared. We see that these two terms will cancel out and we're left with 2e to the x divided by e to the x plus 1 squared. And this is greater than 0 for all x. So, by the way, if you have never seen, that symbol, that upside down a, means for all. So, for all x. And so, therefore, f of x is increasing for all x. And we've shown what we need to show for part a. The second part. Show that f of x is an odd function. Alright, to show that f of x is an odd function, we need to consider f of negative x and see what that gives us. So that's going to be e to the negative x minus 1 divided by e to the negative x plus 1. If I multiply it top and bottom by e to the x, because remember what I'm aiming for is I'm trying to show that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. So I want to change these negative index powers of the exponent to positive powers. So that will be minus, uh, 1 minus e to the positive x over 1 plus e to the x. If I take out a factor of negative 1 in the numerator, I have negative 1 into e to the x minus 1 divided by e to the x plus 1. Now this I can see is f of x, so this is equal to negative f of x. So I've got f of negative x equals negative, or e, f of negative x equals negative f of x. It's a tongue twister. So that means that f of x is an odd function. And that's the end of part two. Part three. Describe the behavior of f of x for large positive values of x. Okay, so here they're essentially asking us what is the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x, which is e to the x minus 1 divided by e to the x plus 1. Okay, so when x becomes very large, the numerator will be dominated by the e to the x term. So the numerator is going to look like e to the x. And when x becomes very large, the denominator will be dominated by the e to the x term. So therefore, the denominator will look like e to the x. So this function will actually look like e to the x divided by e to the x, which is 1. So our limit should be 1. However, the numerator, no matter how large we get, is always going to be slightly less than e to the x. It's always going to have this negative 1 term hanging on the end. And the same can be said for the denominator. It's always going to be just a little bit larger than e to the x. It's always going to have that plus 1 term. So this is going to be a fraction where the numerator is just less than e to the x and the denominator is just larger than e to the x. So it's going to be a fraction which is less than 1. So no matter how large my x value gets, this actually never reaches 1. It's always going to be slightly less than 1. And so we say that the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x is actually 1 but coming from below. So we indicate that with a little minus sign above the 1. Part 4. Hence, sketch the graph of f of x equals e to the x minus 1 over e to the x plus 1. So this is only worth one mark, so it shouldn't be too difficult to actually sketch this graph. And all we really need is the three parts above. They've given us all the information that we need for this graph, to be able to sketch this graph. So what have we seen? We've seen that f of x is increasing for all x. We've seen that f of x is an odd function. And so since we're graphing, we should think, what does an odd function mean in terms of a graph? It means that it has a, a 180 degree rotational symmetry about the origin. So we need to keep that in mind. 
And we've seen that as f as x approaches positive large values, f of x approaches 1. So that's a good place to start. I have an asymptote here, which tells me that when x becomes very large, my function is actually going to be approaching this, this asymptote, which is 1. And remember, we said it approaches from below. So that means it's never going to actually cross that. So it means it's coming in this sort of a manner. And since the function is increasing, I know that it's never actually going to become, never actually going to go above that axis, even when it's not, even when we're not considering very large values of x. So that means my function is going to look something like this. And we know that it's odd. So like we said, <clears throat> an odd function has symmetry, a 180 degree rotational symmetry about the origin. So that should also approach one from just above on the x-axis. So it should look something like this. Now, this should be enough to get you the one mark. The fact that you've shown that it's odd and that it um, approaches 1, I should indicate 1 and negative 1 as our asymptotes, and that it passes through the origin. Obviously, it's going to pass through the origin. We can see just by solving the numerator equal to 0 that x equal to 0 is in fact a solution of the numerator. And then um, subbing in x equal to 0 will give us a function value of zeros as well. Okay. So that's all we need to actually graph f of x, and let's indicate that as f of x. Part 5. Hence or otherwise, sketch the graph of y equal to 1 divided by f of x. So we're graphing the reciprocal graph here. So, when we graph a reciprocal graph, we look where f of x has x-intercepts. So where f of x has x-intercepts, that is f of x is equal to 0, our reciprocal, reciprocal graph 1 over f of x is going to have a vertical asymptote. So let's indicate that vertical asymptote, which is going to be at x equal to 0. So there's a vertical asymptote here, which hopefully we can see. So we have a vertical asymptote there. Now we know that any value which is equal to 1 in the original function is going to also be equal to 1 in our reciprocal graph because 1 divided by 1 is of course 1. So let's also indicate here where we have this asymptote. These are our asymptotes when we're considering the graph approaching positive and negative values of infinity. So our graph is going to look like the following. Where this was, where the original graph f of x was just below 1, our reciprocal graph 1 on f of x is going to be just above 1. So it's going to look something like this. And then where f of x was very close to 0, so just where x is just larger than 0, that means f of x was also very close to 0, we're going to have 1 divided by something very small, which is going to be something very large. So it'll look something like this. And so our graph is going to look like that, although that's quite poorly drawn, but I think you can get the idea. And then the same thing is going to happen in the third quadrant. We're going to look like this, which looks a little bit neater. So it kind of looks like a hyperbola, but it's not really a hyperbola. All right, and that's the reciprocal graph. That's all there is to it. So pretty much you get the marks for recognizing that there is a vertical asymptote and for understanding the behavior of small values of f of x equal large values of 1 over f of x and vice versa. Part B. Solve the quadratic equation z squared plus 2 plus 3i z plus 1 plus 3i equal to 0, giving your answers in the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers. Okay, so there's actually a few ways in which you could go about doing this question. You could try to guess a solution and then use inspection to calculate the second solution. Um, there are some high-level maths ways of doing this. However, probably the most standard way to do this is just to use the quadratic formula, since this is a quadratic equation. So let's go ahead and do that. So z equals minus b, so minus of 2 plus 3i, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so 2 plus 3i squared, 
minus 4 times a, which is 1, and c, which is 1 plus 3i. And then we divide all of that by 2 times 1, which is 2. Okay, so here I have negative 2 minus 3i. Underneath this square root, I'm going to have 4 uh, plus 12i minus 9 minus 4 minus 12i. And we're multiplying all of that by a half. So I'm just going to write by a half. That's the same as dividing by 2. Okay, let's simplify a little bit. I can see that the 12i and the 12i will cancel. I'll see that this 4 and this negative 4 will cancel. So I'm actually left with the square root of negative 9. So plus or minus the square root of negative 9, but we know that the square root of negative 9 is 3i. So 3i divided by 2, which is equal to. It's either equal to. If it's a plus, it's going to be minus 3i plus 3i, so that'll cancel. I'll have negative 2 on negative 2, or negative 2 minus 6i on 2. So that's going to be negative 1 or negative 1 minus 3i. Okay, and that's all there is to that. Part C. Find the integral of x times the tan inverse of x, dx. Okay, so this is a product of functions, and so we're most likely going to use the product rule. So we need to choose our u and we need to choose our v dash. So I clearly can't integrate 10 inverse x off the top of my head, so I'm probably going to set u equal to 10 inverse x and differentiate that. And the derivative of u, or the derivative of 10 inverse x, is going to be 1 divided by 1 plus x squared. So then v dash is going to be equal to x, and so v is equal to x squared on 2. And so our formula tells us that this should be equal to u times v, so x squared on 2 times tan inverse x minus the integral of u dash times v. So that's going to be, firstly I'm going to take out the half out the front, so then it's going to be x squared on 1 plus x squared dx. Okay, now this integral here, we could go ahead and make some sort of a trig substitution, but I think that's very unnecessary in this case because there is a nice little algebraic trick that we can do. We can add 1 to the numerator, but also subtract 1 to the numerator. In doing that, we'll get the following, which will be actually easy, quite easy to integrate. So we'll get the integral of 1 plus x squared divided by 1 plus x squared, so that's just 1, minus 1 on 1 plus x squared. So essentially what I've done here is I've actually done a long division, a polynomial division but we haven't set it out as a polynomial division, it's kind of done by inspection. But now these terms are very easy to integrate, they're standard forms for us, so that's x squared on 2, 10 inverse x, minus a half, the integral of 1 is x, the integral of 1 on 1 plus x squared is actually just 10 inverse, and of course we have plus c. And I'm just going to distribute that half through, just to make it everything look quite nice, It'll be x on 2 plus 10 inverse x on 2 plus c. And that's that. Part d. Let p of x be a polynomial. Given that x minus alpha all squared is a factor of p of x, show that p of alpha equals p dash of alpha equals 0. Okay, so actually the first part of question d is a particular case of the multiple root theorem. So if you've seen the proof of the multiple root theorem, you should actually know how to do this. So it says that p of x has a factor of x minus alpha, all squared. So there are two cases. It could be p of x is equal to x minus alpha, all squared, and that's it. Or there could be some other parts of the polynomial, some other factors. So if there are some other factors, we just multiply it by q, of x, which is an arbitrary polynomial. Now, if it was the first case, that would just be where q of x is equal to 0. So this actually considers all cases. So we have p of x equal to x minus alpha squared times q of x. So the first part is quite easy to show. p of alpha, we just substitute in alpha wherever, wherever we see an x. So we have alpha minus alpha squared times q of alpha. Of course, alpha minus alpha is 0, 0 squared is 0. Anything times 0 is 0, and so we get 0. 
good. Now to show that p dash of alpha is equal to zero, we first need to know what p dash of x is. So we differentiate p of x, p dash x equals. Okay, so this is a product of functions. So first let's differentiate the first term. So that will be two x minus alpha, and then multiply by the second term, plus let's leave the first term, x minus alpha squared, and multiply by the second term. Now we don't know what the derivative of q of x is, it's just going to be q dash x. Okay, now we want to show p dash of alpha is equal to zero, so we sub in p, oh, let's get rid of that. We go p dash of alpha, wherever we see an x we put an alpha. So that's two times alpha minus alpha. So you can already see that this first term is going to be zero. And then we're going to have plus alpha minus alpha squared. And so once again, you can see that this is going to be zero plus zero, which is equal to zero. So let's try zero plus zero, which is equal to zero. And so therefore we've shown that p of alpha equals p dash of alpha equals zero. And that's the first part done. Part two, given that the polynomial p of x equals x to the four minus three x cubed plus x squared plus four has a factor x minus alpha all squared, find the value of alpha. All right, so we're told that that polynomial p of x actually has a double root, and they want us to find what that double root is. So let's differentiate this polynomial. That will give us four x cubed minus nine x squared plus two x. Now I can factor out an x here, and I get 4x squared minus 9x plus 2. And I'd probably like to try to factorize that as well. And I think I can factorize it. So I need two numbers which multiply to give me 8, and add to give negative 9. That'll be minus 1 and minus 8. So I have x into, let's see, 4x and x, so here I'm going to have negative 1, and here I'm going to have uh, 2. Okay, so I've just factorized that quadratic there. So therefore, my possible, now it's important that you know that this is possible double roots, are going to be the, all of the roots of p of x. So possible double roots are x equal to 0, 1 quarter, and 2. Now, if we go ahead and check the value of p of x at each of these values, we'll find that one of them gives us a value of p of x equal to zero. That's actually going to be p of two, so I'll leave you to check that. But we can see that p of two is going to be equal to two, uh, two to the four, which is 16, minus three times eight, which is 24, plus four, plus four. So yeah, that is indeed zero. So therefore, p of 2 equals p of, or p dash of 2 equals 0, and so therefore, we have alpha is equal to 2. And that's the end of that part, and the end of question 12.